Good afternoon, and welcome to the Middle East Forum Speaker Webinar Series and Podcast. I'm Stacey Roman, and I will be moderating this discussion today. We're pleased to have Seth Fransman, Executive Director of the Middle East Center for Reporting and Analysis and a writing fellow here at the Middle East Forum, join us to discuss who will be the Middle East drone superpower. Dr. Fransman will speak for 15 minutes and open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen to type your question. And with that, I will turn the discussion over to Dr. Seth Fransman. Well, great, thank you. Thank you so much for having me today. And uh, hopefully I'm here to talk about, I think a topic that's important and very timely and is, is transforming the world as we know it. And I would point to the fact that <clears throat> just several days ago, we had a, a drone attack on a ship off the coast of Oman. And that those it was apparently several drones that were used, uh, apparently you know commanded from Iran or by Iranian agents or Iranian proxies. They were used to attack a ship that is linked to Israel through a management company uh, based in London. So, if you've been looking at the news, basically Israel has vowed to respond, and there's a full court press on now by the US and the UK in terms of condemning Iran. So those types of drones that Iran used are what's called the kamikaze drones, which means the drone itself is basically the warhead. So it's a bit like a cruise missile. And Iran has become, let's say, I wouldn't not necessarily a pioneer in this technology, but it has been trafficking and using these types of drones all over the Middle East in the last few years. And that includes, for instance, Iran arming the Houthis in Yemen and using drones against Saudi Arabia. It includes an attack in September of 2019 in which 25 Iranian drones and cruise missiles were used to attack a Saudi Arabian uh, energy uh, oil refinery facility called Abqaiq, in which Iran flew drones from Iran to this brazen attack in which no one was killed, but a huge amount of, uh, let's say, energy production was put out of action. It also includes the trafficking of Iranian drone technology to Shia militias in Iraq, where these militias have now begun to use drones to attack US facilities or US forces there to try to pressure the Americans to leave. And in April, there was a very sophisticated drone attack on an airport in the Kurdistan region of Northern Iraq, in which a drone attacked a hangar that is used, or at least reportedly used by the CIA, and that was reported by the Washington Post. So you have a whole series of incidences all around the region, including, for instance, Hamas, using for the first time uh, larger uh, style drones that are like a bit bigger than me, let's say, that have a, a warhead in them that is this type of kamikaze type of drone that is basically launched from a kind of catapult and then flies into a target based on a pre-programmed uh, mission or coordinates that the, the operator puts in. And so we're seeing them pop up in all sorts of places, whether it's Hamas, Hezbollah, Houthis, Shia militias. Uh, also in Syria, we've seen Iranian drones flown from Syria into Israeli airspace, at least several incidents. One was in February 2018, another in this recent war in May, a drone penetrated Israeli airspace. Israel tracked the drone and uh, scrambled um, helicopters or planes to shoot it down over a place near a place called Beit Shan. So if you chart that out and you just put all those points together, you have an arc basically of four three or 4,000 miles, let's say, you know, from Lebanon all the way through Iraq, Iran, the Persian Gulf to Oman and Yemen, of which you have Iranian drones that are now a huge menace to the region. So I mean, that is the most recent details we have in terms of drones. And I, I just wanna, let's go back for a second and discuss briefly a bit of the history of how we got here and maybe try to answer that question, you know, who is the drone superpower or what's, what's coming next. So I wrote a, wrote a book about this, which is called The Drone Wars. It just came out. And the, the book basically looks at a whole history of, of drones. Now, most people, when you say drones, they either think of two types of things. Either they think of usually uh, these quadcopters you can buy at Costco or whatever 
that have four little, you know, rotary blades and you can play with them. They're kind of like cool toys or you can use them to film, you know, mountaineering or weddings or whatever. They're not that big. They're about, you know, let's say about like this or something. They buzz around. They sound like a, a lawnmower or a bee or something. So you can buy those. Those are commercially available. People think they're cool. And then when people hear drones in terms of military stuff, they usually think of the Predator drone, which is, or the Reaper, which is its kind of descendant, which is this American drone that was actually invented by an Israeli engineer in the 80s, early 90s, and was the premier weapon system that the United States used during the war on terror. It was, it gave the United States the capability to hover over targets, to wait for terrorists to emerge, and then do targeted airstrikes to kill them and also to collect surveillance in all sorts of places that maybe you don't want to send, you know, helicopters or F-16s or um, B-2s or B-52s or whatever. Basically, you, you, you want to do it in places like, let's say, Yemen, Somalia, over Pakistan, things like that, you know, areas where maybe you don't have control of the airspace, but it's easier to send drones. Or for instance, uh, the U.S. has used drones to kill terrorists in Idlib province in northern Syria using uh, a weapon system that is similar to a Hellfire missile, what is called a, uh, was sometimes euphemistically called a ninja weapon, which basically takes the warhead out of the missile. And it's basically just the missile is just a hard piece of machinery with blades on it that slams into a car to do a precision strike so that you don't have to kill all the occupants of the car, you just kill one person. Now, what's interesting is if we look at the history of how did we get here to these kind of interesting systems that we that we are seeing more and more of, drones were at, were invented many decades ago and have been around for a very long time. Most of them were what was called remote uh, piloted aircraft or remote piloted vehicles. They always have acronyms like RPV, RPA, UAV. But all that put aside, basically what it is is it's a machine that someone can fly. So. You don't have to have a pilot in it. And drones were used for a lot of mundane tasks. Like for instance, they were used for target practice because if you want to use, try to use a new um, air to air missile, it's obviously preferable to have a, a remote piloted vehicle that you can shoot at as opposed to a person in a plane and, and you end up killing a, your own pilots. So they were being used for all sorts of weird tasks like that. And the Israelis found out after the 1973 war that they needed to have a system that they could use to collect, collect intelligence on air defense batteries that were used by the Syrians in places like Lebanon. Those were Soviet uh, SAM or surface air missile systems. And Israel understood that the real key problem in finding air defense batteries is air defense batteries uh, move around and they're very dangerous and they can kill your pilots. And of course, you don't have an endless supply of pilots. You don't want to lose any aircraft. So. What's better is to send a remote piloted vehicle up there without a person in it and have it take pictures or real time video so that the pilots know where the air defense system is and they can go in there and, and hit it with missiles. So the drones were invented. They were not, uh, not that sexy, but they were invented to do these kind of dull, uh, dirty and dangerous missions over places like the Bekaa Valley in Lebanon in 1982. Israel successfully wiped out all of the Syrian air defense batteries there uh, in basically an afternoon. And it showed all of a sudden that drones were going to be the weapon of the future. And so we now know that the United States very quickly began to experiment with and collect and purchase drones. We know that Israel became a huge drone superpower, not only in the Middle East, but all over the world. Israel was a big exporter of drones all over the world, and Israel was has several companies like um, IAI and other, other companies like Elbit and Aeronautics that make drones, and they began to sell them and also to tinker with the way in which they could be used. So, for instance, Israel realized that one type of system of drones that you want to have is very large surveillance drones that kind of look like an airplane but without a pilot. Another type of drone that's kind of interesting is, let's say you want to suppress air defenses rather than sending in, you know, F-15s or F-16s with missiles on them and risking pilots, wouldn't it be better to take a relatively small drone, pack it full of um, explosives and pack it full of sensors 
so that it can seek out and hunt down air defense uh, radars. And so Israel was able to develop specialized weapon systems like that called the Harpy or Harops, which are drones that all they do is seek out air defense radars or they seek out other types of targets like tanks or artillery and things like that. So Israeli drones have proved uh, very effective in the recent war in Gaza. Israel for the first time, at least publicly, used what was called a drone swarm. And what that is, is you, instead of having one large drone buzzing around in circles, uh, taking video and pictures of let's say a city like Gaza City, you have dozens of little drones buzzing around and they're all connected just like through the, you know, where the internet or what have you, they're all networked. And they build a picture that's a, a kind of uniform picture, all of them together. And they have a kind of brain using artificial intelligence that is able to synthesize all the thing, all the data that they're collecting. So imagine that they're, they're not only taking video, but maybe they have other assets on board. For instance, nowadays with, our, with artificial intelligence and, and optics, you can do what's called automatic target recognition. So let's say, for instance, you want to know the difference between uh, this cup, which is just a cup of water, and let's say a soda can. But in the battlefield, you want to know the difference between a car and a tank, or a pickup truck um, carrying a broomstick and a pickup truck carrying an RPG in the back. So the, the drones collecting all the video intelligence with this kind of artificial intelligence brain that's on a supercomputers or what have you can synthesize all that and can decide for the operator you know what here's all these thousands of cars but you as the operator better look at this one because this one has an rpg in the back a human being can't do that a human being you'd need thousands of people to look be looking all the time it's much preferable to have the machines do it so israel has become a drone superpower in the sense of using artificial intelligence, algorithms, all sorts of um, optics and sensors and scanners and radars, I think to put drones at the forefront of the modern battlefield. And that means often, you know, collecting information or data or surveillance. And that the drone swarm that we just heard about is, is certainly an example, I think, of where we see Israel at the, at the forefront of that. And that, that's not just about developing a drone that flies faster or longer, because that's just a machine. It's about what do you put in it? I mean, an iPhone is just a box. A drone in a sense with, 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 with rotors or whatever on it is still just a box, but it's what you put in it. And that's the software, that's the best optics, that's the radars, all the types of things in there that you can keep updating that. So you can use the same platform, but you know, collecting more information and allowing you to do precision strikes and allowing you to have the right data so you don't kill as many civilians and things like that. So. Israel is certainly a drone superpower today. The United States is interesting because the United States used drones widely under the Obama administration. And then by the time you get to late Obama, let's say um, the last years of the administration, as most people probably remember, that administration became very reticent to use drones, even though in the beginning of the, pre the presidency, Obama had opted for drones because he thought that these were more precise and it would kind of take away from the criticism of these kind of endless wars the United States was, was criticized for fighting in places like Afghanistan. So as we of course now know, the Afghan war continued on until it is now apparently being wrapped up. But when's the last time you heard about a drone strike in Afghanistan? I don't know if I've heard about one for a bit of time. And that what that tells us is I think, because the United States is pretty transparent about its drone program, there are not a lot of drone strikes taking place. It doesn't mean the United States doesn't have drone assets, you know, flying over places like Somalia, maybe Yemen, maybe Pakistan, who knows, maybe Afghanistan, even in Niger and Africa and places like that. The United States, of course, has a lot of drones, but it's not buying as many as it used to. There is, of course, a question mark here if we're asking about who's the drone superpower. The United States is certainly developing probably clandestine programs that we're not aware of. What those programs might be is something that you know looks like a fancy uh, stealth bomber or something, but just doesn't have people in them. Uh, so that's fine. We don't know where that will go. The United States procurement tends to be quite slow when it comes to things like this. So it's not entirely clear if the United States is at the cutting edge of this technology. And I think another country, we mentioned, of course, Iran's role in developing drones. Iran's drones 
are not going to win wars. Iran drones are not as sophisticated as America or the or Israel. But what we're seeing them being used for is all these attacks that give Iran and its proxies, its terrorist groups, plausible deniability. Because when the drones, for instance, attacked this ship just a few days ago, Iran says that wasn't us. There's no evidence that that's us. What do you mean? So so something fell on your ship. We don't know. We don't know what that is. And you know the thing about drones is. It's not always it's not always easy to trace who built it because you know it's it's just materials. What you can do is find the gyroscopes or the engines that are inside the drone. And the United States has very cleverly, along with its partners and allies, uh, been able to show that Iranian drones using a certain type of gyroscopes and engines uh, have been involved in in all sorts of conflicts all over the Middle East, about diff eight different countries. So we know that. I think another rising country we should mention in terms of a drone superpower is uh, China. China is building rapidly large numbers of drones. It is also selling them all over the world. So whereas Israel was a big seller of drones a decade or so ago, China is now a big seller of not only commercial drones, it dominates the market, but also military drones. And those drones tend to not be as expensive as the United US uh, predators. But China is willing to sell them to countries the United States is not selling armed drones to. And that allows those countries to use drones in a way that they otherwise couldn't. And I think the, the final, I think, message as we, let's say, have met the 15 minute mark here is that you should care about these types of weapon systems. Drones maybe will not do what Elon Musk has hinted they could do, which is like defeat F-35s. But the countries in the world that choose to use large numbers of drones and give them to their low level infantry forces and put them on ships and use them in large swarming attacks through the Air Force or, or, or clandestine service like CIA, those countries will begin to dominate and they will be able to carry out very complex attacks. And we should be concerned that you know, a drone swarm could it be used against the U.S. Uh, ship or aircraft carrier. And the big question mark then would be, do we have enough air defense systems to shoot them all down? And I, that would be maybe for another lecture. But I think that that is, of course, the big elephant in the room is whether or not there's enough out there to defend against these attacks. And that the attack on the ship off of Oman or other attacks have shown that, that there isn't always enough air defense systems. Israel has successfully downed Hamas drones without a problem. So I think Israel has done a good job at that, but the rest of the region is more of a question mark. All right, thank you so much. So as to your point about how it's difficult to trace who built a drone, uh, what can the US and Israel do to keep drones out of the hands of terrorists? Well, I'm not sure the US and Israel can necessarily do that much to keep them out of the hands of terrorists, because in the end of the day, if a country like Iran wants to ship drones or blueprints for them, it can. And there may, you know, in terms of the bottleneck of technology, it may, there may not be much that you can stop because it's not that hard to get these small engines and stuff. It may be that it's hard to build very big drones, but certainly in terms of quadcopters, um, ISIS was using quadcopters in, in Iraq. And I, I was in Iraq, I was in the Battle of Mosul, and I, I mentioned it in my book. There was nothing to stop them. So I guess the most important lesson would be not necessarily is I think to first of all build better detection systems and air defenses. And then I think to collect the evidence that shows who is behind it. And you know, of course, you can try to target with sanctions some of these technologies, probably maybe if the engines are being trapped bought in Europe or something. But if the engines are being bought in Russia or China, I don't see why how there's anything the United States or Israel can necessarily do to, to choke that off. It's choking it off at the other side, which is to be able to detect them and shoot them down. And you can shoot down drones with lasers. You can use microwave weapons. You can jam them. So, you know, there is new technology out there. Israel is using, Israel is experimenting with lasers that will be deployed in the next few years, apparently, to shoot things like this down. So that would be good to invest in. Thank you. That brings us to our next question from Rabbi Joel Schwartzman. Given Israel's laser development, can you please comment about drone killers? How effective are they? Are we now entering a period where AI will constitute the wars of the present and future? Well, I think certainly artificial intelligence is going to play a much larger role in warfare. And Israel's um, five-year, multi-year plan called Momentum is supposed to digitize the armed forces. The, the kind of bad news or weird news is 
armies are very slow at acquiring um, new technology. It's odd. Uh, you know, militaries used to be probably ahead of the civilian world, world in terms of technology. I mean, after all, it was it was countries that got to the moon, not uh, not companies, right? But today, iPhones and things <laughs> provide people all sorts of cool uh, apps, like ways that you can navigate with. And sometimes militaries are really slow on the catch up of using new types of radios and new types of technology. So we are seeing AI being applied to all sorts of new things out there, some of which uh, will we'll come online in the next few years and some of which are secretive or whatever. But we, I think the big question mark is when we talk about, you know, will it kind of run the war? AI will give the tools to the operator, whether it's an individual rifleman or a general or whoever, more tools to make decisions faster. So it will tell the person, you know, rather than having to look at a thousand suspicious uh, things, it will tell them, here's two things to look at. Which one, which one would you like to use your, you know, your rifleman on and which one would you use the, like to use the tank to do? And so you just have to make less decisions. And it means war could be faster. It means instead of the Gulf War lasting, the air campaign lasting, you know, 30, 40 days as it did in 91, it might last three days. You could, you could destroy as many things, let's say, and be more precise and more lethal. But I don't think AI is going to make the decisions for the commanders because no commander, you know, a George Patton or a Stonewall Jackson or Napoleon or whoever, or a Qasem Soleimani, really wants to have the computers decide. I think they want to decide. So um, in terms of, I don't know what killer robots or drone killers, all these things, I mean, I think we will see the potential for more network systems in which the system can do more things without the person doing it. Like, I'll give you an example. In America, traditionally, drones were usually flown by pilots. I mean, I mean someone who was trained to fly an F-16 might, might end up flying drones, which is a huge waste of his, his or her time because they're skilled operators. In Israel, the, the people in the Air Force, they're still, they're still operators, they're still in the Air Force, but you know, they, it's more point and click and the drone takes off itself. The drone comes back to base. You don't have to fly it. You just have to make decisions about what to target and things like that. I mean, maybe where it goes. But it's not a, you're not, you know, you're not sitting there with a stick. So I think that's the big difference uh, in terms of what the robots can do in this networks. Understood. Thank you. Uh, from Howard Mednick, is Iran's use of drones an indication of the overall level of technological development in Iran, or is Iran simply purchasing or stealing technology from abroad? No, I think Iran is a very sophisticated, smart country. It's able to do a lot with very little. And, you know, Iran has been under sanctions for a very long time. It's also been building drones for a very long time. It's interesting. I think the Iranian drone program probably helped to get its start from the fact that there were factories in Iran under the Shah that were American factories like Textron that were building Bell helicopters and things. So when the, when the Islamic revolution happened, the Iranians inherited pretty high, at that time, pretty high tech stuff. And even though things like in the Iranian Air Force, you know, many of the planes, for instance, have not been updated since the 1970s. They've had to refurbish them, but they're flying planes from a very long time ago. The drones is one place Iran could say, wait a sec, we can't buy new, you know, MiGs or F-15s. What we can do is build an instant Air Force using, you know, drones that are simpler technology, but it's not that hard to build an airframe that's not that big. And all we have to do is pack it with explosives and fly it into something. And when it comes to Iranian drones, what's interesting is it's not like, uh, you know, American Global Hawk, which costs $200 million. <laughs> it's much cheaper. And Iran is willing to be, ex they're expendable. So it, that's the mo Iranian model is it's expendable. It's pre-programmable. You don't have to have an operator flying it. And once again, Iran's drones are not that sophisticated. They're kind of like the German V1 in the sense that the machine goes somewhere and then slams into a target. It's not coming back to base. Usually, I mean, there are there are Iranian drones that can do that. They can come back to the base, but there are some that don't do that. And I think that where we see Iran using them in threats, they're the type that don't come back to base. When Iran boasts that they have a drone that flies 7,000 kilometers and can fire missiles, I think that's all basically nonsense. And there's no evidence that they can do that. But they're getting better every day. And the attack on the ship which I mean is a complicated attack because it's a moving target. How do you, how do you target a ship without real-time intelligence? That's complicated. The attack on Abkhake was a big deal because the drones didn't just fall to the sky willy-nilly. They targeted precision areas and didn't kill anyone. So it was a very thoughtful attack. And I think you know, that's why it points to real human, uh, human intelligence, real 
real smart development and real use of resources in a smart way. Thank you. Jay Lewis asks, is there any defense for com commercial ships against drones, such as the recent attack? Yes, I think probably there are, but it's a bit complicated. So you can, uh, there are so many commercial ships, it's probably difficult and expensive to outfit them all. So let's say you just wanted to outfit a subset of them, let's say. Now, you, you don't want to put an iron dome system on ships because you don't have a lot of iron dome systems. So you probably wouldn't put a missile system like that on it. But there are other types of drone, um, I guess there are other types of systems out there that can be used sometimes to, that you probably need a hard kill technique because these types of drones, I think, usually for instance, like systems like Drone Guard, what they do is they have a radar that detects the drone far away. And then they have optics that, that confirm it's a drone, i.e. it's not a plane or a bird or something. So they, they, then they have um, a system that detects the frequency it might be using to try to jam it. Now, if it's not controlled by a person, then jamming the frequency may not help you. So then you need to shoot it down somehow. Now, in terms of the systems that exist, uh, there are systems like Ex Extend makes a system for special forces where the drone is, a drone goes up to kill a drone where it drops a net on it. Um, there's things like that. There is, I guess, microwave weapons we've heard about. There's also a system called Smart Shooter, which is made in Israel, which is basically a rifle site that helps the, the, the shooter find the thing. Again, though, against, a, against these types of Iranian drones that were used against the ship, that may, that's probably not big enough, it may not be a big enough weapon system to, to, uh, to take them down. So you may need um, some sort of CRAM uh, or some sort of missiles. And I would think that that's costly to put on ships because I don't think you can put missiles on lots of, actually it's probably somehow legal to put missiles on sorts of a commercial ships. So I don't know how that works in international law. You probably is not gonna go happen. So someone's gonna have to think this through. There may not be a good defense against this. Um, although to, to be fair in the Gulf of Oman, you have military assets there, naval ships like the Fifth Fleet. You can use those ships to shepherd commercial vessels and those ships have a, an air defense umbrella, let's say around them. So that those ships can, maybe those ships can defend an airspace that is like a hundred kilometers across or something. So that's maybe one way to do it is to have naval units as pickets, you know, defending areas or something like that. Thank you. And Sandro Bilastrani, Strano, sorry, uh, ask, would you please comment on the importance of undersea cable network to remotely piloted military drones? That's a question I just know nothing about. I mean, I don't, I don't even understand it exactly. Undersea cable networks, remote. I'm sorry, I just don't, I don't know enough about it, so I wouldn't want to comment on it and, and be and sit, be misleading. So sorry. Sure thing, no problem. Elliot asks, how far advanced is Turkey in this field? Their drones played a prominent role in helping Azerbaijan defeat Armenia. We were fortunate enough to have you on for a webinar all on this, but could you give us a briefing? Well, look, that's a very good question. So Turkey's interesting. Turkey, not so long ago, um, was, a, was a good member of NATO and uh, close to the West and was buying Israeli drones. And under the current regime, of course, you know, became much more hostile to the West and Israel. And of course, that has an after effect in terms of its, its, its defense programs, because it began to buy Russian S-400s and things like that. And it began to want to be totally independent, I think, defensively. So it began to build its own drones. And Turkey had a drone program before, but they've developed a whole series now of these Bayraktar drones, which are being sold, it appears, in now in Poland or maybe Ukraine, and, and they're being used in Syria, Libya, Azerbaijan. So the, the Bayraktar is a, I don't think it's a very fast drone. You can put, you can put missiles on it. And I think it is good for fighting in places where you don't have a lot of air defense systems or the air defense systems are being um, manned by people that are a bit incompetent, which, which was the case in Libya. The Panzer 22 systems, which are Soviet, or, sorry, Russian systems, were just, uh, apparently the operators were pretty incompetent. The, the system apparently can shoot down Bayraktars. They're just not, the operators, it was operator error apparently. So Turkish drones, it looks like they're going places with this. It's going to become a big exporter of drones because Turkey is not afraid to sell armed drones. And the Americans, who are the big builder of armed drones, the kind of you know big behemoth, doesn't want to sell them to anyone because America, for, for all sorts of reasons and rules and exports and all those things, doesn't like to sell armed drones. So, well, when you have a vacuum, people are going to run into it. And the Chinese and the Turks are running in. 
So I think that Turkey is building interesting drones. I think Bay Raptors will not work against a peer adversary. So it's nice they're saying that Poland, what is Poland going to do? Use them against the Russians? I mean, I don't know what they're, th I don't know what they're thinking we use them for. The Azeris use the Bay Raptors, but you know, Azerbaijan's campaign is interesting. They used Israeli drones, apparently, or well, Israeli, Israeli companies that had sold drones, apparently or reportedly, to take out the air defenses. That left the Armenians uh, quite, quite naked in a sense. And then the Bayraktors went in there to shoot the tanks and stuff, which are just big, boring, blubbery, slow armored vehicles. So I think that it was a kind of one-two punch because in the end of the day, you know, you ask yourself, well, which one, which, which, which one was it? Was it the Bay Raptors didn't win the war? It was a combination of using multiple layers of drones, including, by the way, apparently using these decoy planes that they had turned into remote piloted vehicles that decoyed these air defense systems. So Azerbaijan should be credited with being very smart and 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 doing a kind of instant air force multi-layered approach. But I think it might be a mistake to read that conflict as just the Turks did everything. I think certainly Turkey has used it as a sales pitch. But again, I think Turkey will sell its drones all over the world, but they may, they may not be they may not be effective in a in a real conflict against a country that has real air defenses. But as I said before, America used drones basically that way as well. It never sent drones into a, an, a contested environment with air defenses. America used drones in areas what were what they call ungoverned spaces like Somalia or something. So, so it seems that like Turkey is just learning from the US example. Thank you so much. And before we go, could you just remind our viewers where we can find some more of your work? Sure, you can read, of course, you can find the book at Amazon or online places like Book Depository. You can, of course, read me at the Jerusalem Post or National Interest or Defense News, where I, do, it's where I cover defense technology like this um, in other places sometimes. So, yeah, those, those will be the main, the main platforms. All right, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we've come to the close of our webinar. Thank you again, Dr. Fransman, for taking time to speak with us today. Thank yeah. you. Of course. For our viewers and listeners, please join us Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern for an update from, yeah, for an update from Ashley Perry. Thank you all for joining us and I hope you have a great day. Thanks.